It is 2021 and it's our first episode of Broadcaster in the new year. I'm Roger Hoover with you from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We've got Kyle Crooks from Gainesville, Florida. And in the center of the screen from his home in Chicago, it is the new radio broadcaster for the Chicago White Sox, Lynn Casper. Lynn, it's great to see you. Are you still getting new, used to the new title that you have starting this year? <laughs> hey, Roger. Hey, Kyle. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it's definitely been surreal. I think it was now five weeks ago uh, that the the big story came out, and uh, I'm I'm really excited about 2021 for a lot of reasons. Uh, let's hope that uh, we bounce back and are able to get back to some sort of uh, normal life. Uh, it would be great to to start close to on time and have some fans in the ballparks. And uh, yeah, I, I, a new team, a new challenge for me, and uh, I'm I'm really pumped about it. And Len, how tough was the decision? Obviously, that that's what everybody's talking about, going from TV to radio, from the Cubs to the White Sox. But for you, this this was your passion. Um, but how tough was that decision? How long did that decision uh, take to go from you know TV to radio? Yeah, Kyle. You know, it. I had done television for the last basically twenty years. Um, I started in radio, and you know, I just got to the point. Uh, I turned 50 in a couple of weeks where, you know, if I had uh, one last shot to, to do the thing that I really uh, dreamed of doing when I was a kid, I thought uh, I have to at least consider it. Uh, it was not an easy decision uh, to, to leave a job that I would consider the best in sports. Um, but I had that job for 16 years, and I, I really thought about all the boxes that I had checked off uh, with the Cubs and would have been very happy to, to remain in that position for uh, as long as possible. And that was always my goal uh, with the Cubs. But I think over the last couple of years, just kind of contemplating again the big picture and you know, having the opportunity to call some postseason games as well uh, played into that. You know, there's no guarantee uh, the, the team I'm with now is going to be in the postseason. But uh, when, in, if and when they do make it, I'll be able to be behind the microphone, and it's it's not about you know having my calls remembered for posterity or anything like that. It's all about the work, and uh, it, it, it's it's kind of like being a, a starting second baseman for 162, and then you're left off the active roster when the postseason starts. And um, you know that that definitely played into this. And we didn't have to move. My family loves Chicago. Uh, I, I I don't think that I would have considered making a move like this to another club in a different city. Uh, but all the stars kind of aligned at this moment in time. And that's ultimately why uh, I, I decided to make the move. And do you think about this when you're doing, you know, spring training games on the radio? I know you do some, you know, online streams for them when the Cubs are in spring training. Do, do you think at, at a certain point in the back of your mind, maybe even years ago that like down the line, this is could be a strong possibility again you said you didn't want to move cities but this is still something that's been in the back of my mind and, and radio is something always uh, i always wanted to to give a shot is that something that was always in the back of your mind well the fact that i had done uh, webcasts uh in spring training with mick gillespie uh i had done fill-in radio for pat hughes uh, i actually did a, a daily pregame interview uh with the pitching coach and then um Last year, I, I basically you know did my own segment and just interviewed uh, various baseball people uh, with other teams, uh, and I really got a kick out of that. And that was just because I loved uh, doing radio. So, um, you know, anyone who had followed my career somewhat closely uh, would have had a bit of an aha moment when they they heard the news because it is something that I had done on a limited basis in addition to my TV duties. And I, look, I love television. This is not an indictment of the medium in any way. Um, but when you have this thing kind of in your soul and in your heart that you really love to do, and you, know, you have a long period of time where you're not doing it, and, and you're able to have you know, success uh, and put yourself in a position where maybe you can go back to, to your roots, so to speak, uh, that's... That's kind of the genesis of all of this. 
And you mentioned those spring training webcasts for the Cubs with Mick. I remember producing and engineering a few of those uh, with you guys out in Arizona. And I just remembered when you'd sit down, ball game, pregame show was done. It was the top of the first inning. You were on the play-by-play call. I just saw you so relaxed. What was it about just those first few pitches of a game when you know you're on radio, you know you get to paint the picture that you like so much, and now you get to do uh, all year long? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, I, I would like to think that's the way I feel when I do television as well. When the game starts, that's those are those three hours. That's all the hard work, all the research, you know, all the time you spend preparing. Uh, once the first pitch is thrown, man, that's that's why we do what we do. Um, but yeah, I think you know a little extra bounce in my step, you know, kind of having control of everything and and as you guys know on television uh, there's a producer and a director and an associate producer and you know probably a 25 to 30 person crew uh and and it's a great team effort and when you do great television there's no better feeling when everybody's on the same page and and you can do some amazing things but for a broadcaster there's nothing better than the purity of when the game starts the microphone opens you kind of control the action in the booth and what people hear and what kind of they see through the radio and uh, that's very intoxicating I I, I can't deny that and I think a lot of people who've done it uh, for a long period of time would tell you the same thing and one of those people was the late Ernie Harwell who is of course the soundtrack to all of your summers at growing up in Michigan listening to the Detroit Tigers uh, what kind of influence was he first of all to that young Lynn Casper listening to the Tiger games and then what can you tell us about the relationship you had with him over the years yeah I was really lucky you know you end up kind of following and idolizing the broadcasters in your local area when you're my age you know now that's not necessarily the case. You can uh, get the MLB app and, and listen to any of the local broadcasts. But <clears throat> when I was uh, growing up in the in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, when I would turn on the radio, it would be Paul Carey and uh, the great Ernie Harwell. And Ernie just, he, he had a way of painting the picture very poetically. Literally, if you took uh, an inning of his call and wrote it down as a transcript, it would, it would read uh, like poetry. He, he was incredibly efficient with how he described things, uh, had a, a masterful control of the history of the sport. Uh, he was from Georgia. He had a, a, a Southern lilt in his voice, but he was Ernie. He was, he was our Ernie from Michigan. Uh, and uh, just everybody loved him. And I very quickly thought that would be the coolest job in the world. And Paul Carey, uh, his, his partner who did the middle three innings and actually engineered all their games, uh, he, he carried the equipment and uh, you know, made sure that they sounded great. Uh, he had what, what Ernie called the voice of God. They just were a wonderful tandem. And uh, they worked together for 19 years, and I, I listened to a lot of those games. Uh, so... I met Ernie when I was in college at Marquette. Uh, it was actually 1991 when I met him in Milwaukee at County Stadium, and that was uh, his his farewell tour after the radio station and, and the Tigers told him that they weren't going to bring him back. And uh, I interviewed him, and he could not have been nicer. And he he said my name like three times during the interview, and uh, just just you know you're always nervous about meeting your heroes that they're not going, going to kind of live up to the, the vision you had uh, in, your, in your head about w- what they would be like personally. And he um, was way nicer than I ever could have imagined. And so at that point, I probably saw him again maybe a year or two later. He eventually did return to the, to the Tigers. Uh, but I, I just remember the next time I saw him, he remembered who I was. And you have no idea how big a deal that is for for a, for a kid, uh, again, whose idol uh, remembered that he had met you two years ago, remembered your name, remembered who, where you were from. And so, uh, you know, we stayed in touch a bit over the years. And then when I got my first big, big league job full time with the uh, Florida Marlins, 
uh, the, the, the person who hired me, Jeff Gentner, uh, was, uh, had Michigan ties. He, he went to Michigan state and, uh, later, uh, worked in Detroit. And so he knew Ernie and he had, uh, told Ernie about me when I got the job and Ernie had remembered and he, 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 he wrote me uh, a nice note, uh, to congratulate me on getting the job, which was really cool. Uh, I believe that that year, that first year with the Marlins, the Tigers played in Miami. And uh, I have a picture somewhere of Ernie, my father, my son, and me. So it's three generations of Caspers with Ernie, which was really neat. Uh, then when I got the Cubs job, he called me at home uh, to congratulate me. Uh, that summer, he uh, called because t- at the time he... Uh, was retired, but he was doing columns for, I believe, the Free Press, Detroit Free Press. And he wrote one of his weekly columns on my journey. Uh, so that was surreal. And and all the answers I gave him about my influences and how I kind of patterned my my call and all that stuff, it was about him. And he didn't include any of that stuff in the, in the article. Uh, he made sure that it was it was all about me and not him, even though every answer I gave was about him. Uh, and then around 2009, I think, the Cubs were in Detroit, and uh, Judd Surratt, who was now the radio voice of the Bruins, he was doing Cubs radio uh, pre- and post-game. He and I uh, took a cab out to, to Ernie's uh, home and uh, had lunch with him, uh, got to meet Miss Lulu, and uh, it was just a, a great experience. And uh, unfortunately, Ernie passed away about six months later. He He had not uh, been well. Um, but I was very thankful I had the opportunity to spend some more time with him. So, you know, I wouldn't say we were great friends, but uh, we definitely had a lot of uh, correspondence and, uh, he, he was incredibly encouraging and I asked him a lot of questions and, uh, that, that, that meant a lot to me. And, uh, to this day, uh, has a huge impact. And I, I still, you know, once a week, I dial up an old, an old tiger broadcast on, their YouTube channel and, you know, listen to a Tigers Brewers game from 1978 and just uh, get to listen to Ernie do his thing. It's, it's pretty amazing. And the way Ernie kind of helped you along in your path, do you have a lot of young broadcasters that reach out to you and and you think about how great Ernie was to you and then you kind of pass that along to a new generation? Is that how you, you think of it in in the role that you've had for so many years in, in a prominent position? You know, Kyle, I've, I've tried, you know, I've tried to do my best. Um, yeah, I know a lot of uh, young broadcasters like Roger. Uh, we mentioned Mick Gillespie. Uh, you know, Joe Davis is someone I've known since he was in college. Uh, I've known Adam Amin for, for several years. Jason Benetti, who uh, now is one of my best friends, um, he still has the email he sent me from 10 years ago and um, sent me a demo and read some of what I replied to him with. And, uh, that was really cool. Uh, that, that's a, that's a big part of this, I think is, is paying it forward and passing on whatever, you know, little bits of knowledge you can. Uh, everybody has a different journey, a different path, a different style. And I've never claimed that my way is the right way. Uh, I think everyone's way should be their own way. It should be unique. It should be something that they have that nobody else has. Um, but just little tips here and there, and I, I get a kick out of uh, any sort of accomplishment, um, you know, uh, job growth, uh, s- someone moving forward, winning an award. You know, those things always uh, tickle me to death when it's somebody I've known for a long time. And I, I always feel proud that, uh, you know, that, that they relied on me for some small bit of advice along the way. And how much even now, you know, long into this? Do you study your own work, go back, watch games, and now on the radio, go back after it and listen to a full game? Are you still self-evaluating on a nightly basis, even this deep into this career? 100%. I think I will until the day I'm done. Uh, It's never perfect. Uh, I'm I'm not trying to be perfect, uh, but I always, you know, and I don't necessarily listen to entire broadcasts, but. Um, I just try to pick random games and and I I think it's hard to do it the day of or the day after even if, if you can, ideally it's good to go back a few weeks 
because when you listen to something really fresh, uh, you kind of remember exactly what you said. But if you listen to something from a month ago, uh, you hear it with fresh ears. And so you might surprise yourself with something that you said that was really good that may not resonate uh, in your brain when you hear it three hours after you said it. Uh, and conversely, if you know there's if you feel like you had a great broadcast and you go back and you listen, um, you know maybe two weeks later you go, you know what? Uh, I could have been a little better with this. Uh, but but by and large, I think the goal is consistency, and I think other people hear you pretty consistently over the years and they generally like my favorite broadcasters and these include a lot of good friends of mine in uh, not only baseball but other sports they kind of sound the same every night and that's what you're trying to get to uh i don't know if you can hear my dogs by the way i think the uh, mailman just got here but uh <laughs> you feel different every day you probably think you sound different every day but over the course of time, even you will go back and you will listen to something or watch one of your games, and you'll you'll get to the point where it should sound pretty similar most days. So all I'm looking for, guys, or listening for, is generally pacing and energy. Those are the two uh, things that I suppose every once in a while could very subtly wane. Uh, if you've got a day game after a night game, you know, a long road trip, whatever. I think the key is in those moments where maybe physically uh, or health wise, you're not feeling 100 percent that you sound like you are. And and so I guess those two things are, are, are the big notes for me, not necessarily phrasing or the call itself. Uh, whenever there's a walk off home run, you kind of want to know, you know, did I did I hit that one? Did I nail it? And you go, eh, OK, it was OK. Or, oh, yeah, that sounded good. But but generally, the big picture for me is making sure my pacing and my energy are up to my standards. And of course, every broadcasting journey is different. Uh, what can you tell us about the steps you took uh, after you were a student at Marquette that ultimately led you to the major leagues? Yeah, after I graduated, uh, I still worked part time at a radio station uh, in Milwaukee, and uh, also helped with the uh, the Marquette Basketball Network. Um, and I applied for pretty much every. I think I sent a resume and a demo tape to every single A and double A team in the minor leagues, and I I don't know why I didn't keep all the rejection letters. Uh, <laughs> But I got a lot of them and about so this would be almost a year after I graduated April of 94 Steve Wexler who was the program director at WTNJ radio in Milwaukee TMJ was the and still is the flagship of just about everything uh, the Packers the Bucks the Brewers Wisconsin uh, basketball football and he had heard me on the other station, and he offered me a job uh, producing and, and doing uh, a baseball show on Sundays. And I said yes, uh, and I accepted it. And a day after I got hired, uh, I got a call from one of the general managers who had my stuff, and he was at a place that either had moved or folded, and he took over another club in Springfield, Illinois. And he said, I still have your tape. Would you want this job? And I said, well, if you had called me yesterday, I, I, I absolutely would have. But I had already made a commitment uh, to, to the station in Milwaukee. I suppose I could have uh, called uh, Steve and said, hey, you know, uh, this is really what I want to do. And he, I'm, I, I have no doubt he would have let me do it. Uh, I didn't sign a contract or anything. It was a verbal agreement. Um, but it just didn't feel right. So that, that was one of those seminal moments. And, you know, I'm, if I'm telling some young broadcaster getting out of college, you know, go the minor league route, uh, that's not how I did it. It's a lot. It's, it's how a lot of broadcasters have done it. So I stayed in, in a uh, big league market and six years later was filling in on Brewers television as a result of my relationship uh, with the flagship station and with the team. You know, these are choices you make at the time. You you think, you hope 
Uh, they're the right decisions, but you don't know ultimately. Uh, I met my wife there. Uh, my son was born there. Uh, so it ultimately, on a personal level, became the greatest decision of my life. But from a career uh, perspective, it also ended up working out, even though there were some twists and turns along the way and some frustrations that I wasn't getting a lot of baseball opportunities. But I had a really good job where I was covering sports. I did Packers pre and post game. You know, I ended up kind of you know, carving out a, a nice niche in that radio community in Milwaukee and your reputation builds. And over the course of time, when you let people know, hey, I have an interest in doing baseball at some point, uh, if you do good work, you know, you, you might get that chance at some point. And for you, the fill-in work uh, really led to some great opportunities as well. You get to go to the Florida Marlins to do some television there before going to the Cubs. Uh, when you first went to the Marlins, uh, what were some of the early kind of welcome to the big league moments and as you started to figure out how to do this on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, that, it was a whirlwind. I've, I've, you know, forgotten a lot of the things that have happened, but, I mean, just being around some veteran guys, man, and learning the ropes, um, just from a broadcast perspective, Dave Van Horn, the, uh, the hall of famer, uh, who started in 1969 with the Expos. Uh, he was the, and still is the Marlins radio voice. Uh, my good friend, John Shambi, that's where we became great friends. He was Dave's partner. Tommy Hutton was my partner on television. Uh, one of the best broadcasters who's ever done it. Uh, Tommy came up, as a 19-year-old, made his big league debut with the Dodgers, uh, made a big tour around the National League, was a really good pinch hitter. Uh, Phillies, Expos, Dodgers, as I mentioned, uh, I think a little time with the Blue Jays, and then was a broadcaster really the day after he retired. So that was huge. Uh, and then just some of the Marlins players, I mean, I Jeff Torborg was a veteran manager. And then the next year was Jack McKeon to have Mike Lowell and Kevin Millar and Cliff Floyd and Preston Wilson and Ryan Dempster, uh, Jeff Conine, Derek Lee. I mean, it's just this amazing list of guys who are still friends of mine and we're kind of learning how to behave in the big leagues and what it's like on the road and, you know, how you tip people and, you know, just, there are all these little unwritten rules and how you have to go about your business. And uh, I kind of got thrown in the deep end and thankfully had a lot of really cool guys who uh, took me under their wing. And then the second year I was there, the Marlins won the World Series. That was an incredible uh, ride, an odyssey. Uh, and I'll never forget just how that season went. Miguel Cabrera and Dontrell Willis made their major league debuts that season and just took the league by storm. Uh, so that, that was that was quite an experience, uh, especially for a Midwest kid living in, in, in Florida, uh, which was a very different experience uh, for my family and me. And uh, we went through two hurricanes uh, before we uh, came back to the Midwest. And uh, that was interesting and crazy and not a whole lot of fun. But uh, it's something I guess I can cross off the list. And I try to forget about 03 because I'm a Yankees fan. So watching, you know, Don Trell <laughs> come into Yankee Stadium and, and beat the Yankees, that wasn't a fun experience. But uh, where were you? Do you remember the moment when you get the call from the Cubs that they want you to come over and, and be the TV guy? What, what was the the first kind of emotion that, that goes through you once you get that phone call? Yeah, it's incredible. Um, I knew that it was a really big deal. It was a huge deal when I got the Marlins job. That was my, you know, emotionally, I don't know if anything will ever replace the kind of getting the call to the big leagues. Uh, but when the Cubs thing happened, uh, I think on a personal level, it was enormous to be able to move back to the Midwest uh, and be around uh, my family and my wife's family and to know that we could raise our son uh, in the Midwest. That that was a big deal. Um, and then just the enormity of the Cubs and WGN. At the time, the Cubs were still on the Superstation for half their games. So it was kind of like getting a national job. Uh, even though you were doing, you know, local games uh, and to think about Jack Brickhouse and Harry Carey and Steve Stone and just the incredible list of people who had been in that booth uh, and to get to work with Bob Brenly, uh, someone I had long uh, followed in terms of his playing and, and managing career. So all of that stuff. Um, I'm sure I thought deeply about at the time, but again, my head was spinning and I was just trying to figure out how to be really good and 
uh, not not the uh, I guess a talk show topic every day. And uh, it, it I think it took maybe a year or two to kind of get people to understand my style and my philosophy. And you know, it's a very provincial town here in Chicago, and they want to know that you're here and you're one of them, and uh, that you think of the world kind of similarly. And because I had mis- Midwestern roots, I think that was the case. Um, but it's just a new voice, and it takes people a while to get used to that. And once you're in, you're in. Um, but that's why this, this game is so great because you get to do it every single day. And over the course of a few weeks or months, people are like, Oh, okay. He's okay. He's, he's, he's our guy. And I'm interested when somebody takes a big job like that, how you try to internalize all the pressure that's out there. And, and there's people who have jobs literally to critique sports media. So there's people that write about the broadcast. There's people that write about the broadcasters. In a big city, big market, big team, how do you handle the pressure of that job in, in the first couple of years? There are probably two ways to do it. One is to ignore all of it, try, try to avoid it. Um, the other is kind of embrace it and just shrug it off. Um, you know, you never want to take praise too seriously and you never want to take criticism too seriously. And uh, I just decided that in order to do my job uh, correctly, I kind of had to, to be on the Internet and I had to follow what was going on. And so I, I almost literally couldn't avoid it. Um, so I, you just it, it, you get thick skin over the course of time. And look, I, I won some people over. I know there were some radio talk show hosts who were critical of my work early on and they became friends of mine. And it was all the same stuff I just told you about. Uh, you know, when they don't know who you are and you make a mistake, you know, you get you get dinged a little extra hard for it. Um, but when you're established and you're good at what you do, uh, they tend to kind of give you a little bit of a break. So that's just that's just kind of how it that's just kind of how it develops. And it has to be a natural process. And I think you can't force it. You can't push it. Uh, it's just something that has to happen naturally. And you also can't force chemistry with your partners. And as a Cubs fan, just watching you and first up, Bob Brenly really enjoyed all the jokes you guys would have. And you're talking about, oh, here's another shot of the podcast studio still being built, things like that. I mean, you know, 10 years later, I still remember those things. Um, and then Jim Deshays was the exact same thing. So I think it helps to have a great partner. But uh, just what is it about the process of getting to know those new partners and then developing that on-air chemistry? It's real simple, guys. When your partner gets um, credit or praise, that that's praise for you, and that that's uh, that's the thing I've always felt and will always look at my job. You know that my that, uh, a huge part of my job is to make my partner comfortable and sound as great as he can sound. And if it you elevate everybody else, you've done most of your job. Uh, so it's the relationship you have with that on-air partner that's everything. Uh, the trust involved. Uh, there are stories in in the history of, of broadcasting in different sports where you've had even successful pairings of guys who didn't like each other. And sometimes you hear a story and you're like, what? You know, they sounded so amazing together. Like, yeah, they, they pretty much hated each other personally. Um, they were able to kind of deal with it and, and, and be good on the air. But I always think how much better they could have been if they actually genuinely liked each other. And I've been really fortunate in being with every partner I've worked with. They've all done it for the right reasons. They've wanted to be great. They've wanted me to be great. They've been supportive. Um, and, and that's to me the, the, one of the great parts of this job is building that relationship. Um, sometimes it means spending a little less time with somebody off the air and it's kind of counterintuitive and a bit of a paradox. It's like, well, if you get along with somebody, you like them so much, why wouldn't you spend more time with them? And, uh, I think the answer guys is pretty simple. Uh, during a baseball season, when you get on the team bus at three o'clock, um, you're essentially around that person for about seven hours a day. Uh, that's a lot of time. And it's not just the three hours during the game. But I think if you spend all day with that person, by game time, you might be a little sick of them or they might be sick of you. But the other thing is you end up having a lot of the great conversations off the air that you want to have on the air. 
And so what I try to do is avoid a lot of the topics and, you know, you get into certain things off the air with, with your partner, but, you know, I rarely, if ever will tell uh, JD and now DJ, Hey, I'm going to ask you about this during the broadcast. That's the opposite of how I think a good broadcast should go when there's trust involved the initial reaction to the question or the thought or the story or the joke or the tweak, that's gold. That's, that's broadcast gold. And you never, ever want to have that moment off the air. You want to have it on the air. doesn't mean that it works every time, but to me, you don't ever want to script a live broadcast, especially a baseball game where you're reacting to things. Uh, I, I find the, the crook and kite, um, Mickey Redmond and Ken Daniels, uh, the Red Wings announcers, you know, they just open the microphones and they talk and they tweak each other and they know kind of how to push each other's buttons. And that's what makes those broadcast pairings so great. Of course, uh, with the Cubs games, you mentioned it earlier, it's kind of like being on a national broadcast already, whether it was on WGN or now with Marquee and the way it was last year. Uh, But for you, you've also had the experience of getting to go on Fox and doing a truly national game and giving it a truly national call. Just how did you approach those assignments and how much did you enjoy uh, getting to do things a little more down the middle? Really, uh, I've enjoyed doing the national games and hope to, to still do a few more. Uh, down the road, as I like to say, I dabble in it, but you know I don't have any goals beyond that. Uh, to be honest with you guys, it's just challenging myself to get out of my comfort zone, uh, work with other people, other analysts, uh, other producers, directors. I think it's always good to be a little uncomfortable, to be on your toes a little bit, and uh, again, just to say, hey, can I do this? Can I be good at this? Um, you know, the exposure and the money, like all that stuff helps. But, you know, the bottom line for me is, you know, I don't need to do that stuff. I want to do it. And I'm at the point now in my career where it's got to be something I want to do. Um, the, you know, um, See, Lynn, we stopped hearing you for a second. Len, if you can hear me, we couldn't hear you in that last answer, if that's all right. I don't think his mic is working right now. Might have the mic oh, muted for switch. a second. Well, let's see. I know you're hand-holding the iPhone. We appreciate how long you have been. A little behind the scenes here, but... Uh... There we are. All right, good deal. You want to know what happened? <laughs> good. Yes. yes. <laughs> you want to know what happened? Uh, I have uh, the Bluetooth in my car outside literally grabbed my phone. <laughs> Well, good deal. That is so weird. Hang on a second. You got me now? We yeah. got you. Oh, good to sorry. go. Sorry. Anyway, and we, again, appreciate your hand holding. I mean, I wish you could prop it up or anything, but you have uh, been doing great work with this. <clears throat> so uh, the only the big disappointment I had last year, I had done Fox games. They were involving the Cubs. But I had not done non-Cubs national games, and I had – a pretty good list of games that I was slated to do this past year. I think Phillies, uh, the Nationals, uh, had a Dodgers-Braves. I had a uh, Cardinals-Red Sox game at Fenway Park, and, you know, all of those got canceled due to uh, the pandemic. But, um, yeah, I really really like the idea of doing uh, a few games uh, between teams that I don't have a personal interest in, and, and, you know, that's kind of the next thing to cross off my list, and, and hopefully I'll get a chance to do a few of those. And let's uh, switch over to radio now. You're full time in radio here. What what makes a great radio broadcast? How descriptive do you like to get in your call? I know there's there's certain variations of how descriptive people like to get. How far do you like to go in terms of description? Well, I want to be descriptive for sure, but I also don't want to be too wordy, and that's kind of going back to the Ernie Harwell influence. Um, you know, <laughs> he. He had a way of, uh, there was a great line uh, in a game I just listened to recently where he literally said, um, 
the umpire, the home plate umpire, and I don't, I don't know who it was, but um, let's say it was Al Clark. He said, Al Clark holding up two fingers on each hand. Now, that's an incredibly efficient, poetic way of saying the count is two and two, right? Um, you know, so I think it's more about vocabulary and changing up how you describe things, keeping it simple. You know, I don't think using big words that people have to look up is the way to do it. And to be too clever or too cool for school, I, that's not that's not my goal here. Um, but I definitely think that uh, where the ball is, what the score is, those things are always paramount and, and probably can't be repeated uh, often enough. Uh, I do have uh, a little egg timer that Ernie used to use, uh, and I believe it's a two-minute timer. And so when you know he he'd flip it over, and when that when he'd glance over and the the sand had run out, he would he would say the score. Uh, and I think that you know, it, it, keep it simple, stupid, right? Like the bottom line is when you're doing a game on radio, you don't want eight or nine minutes to go by without someone do- jumping in on the on their car radio and not knowing what the score is. Yes, we have smartphones. And if you're listening on XM, the score is probably on the digital readout. But I'm still viewing it like a vast majority of the radio audience is listening to what I have to say. And if I don't give the score, they don't know what it is. How much do you like to describe some of the other things going on in the ballpark, whether it's, you know, the, the popcorn vendor walking up the stairs or the, the cloud formations and the weather. And I feel like as a radio nerd, and I feel like Len, you're probably a radio nerd like I, I am and, and Roger are. How, how much do you like to really dive into some of the other things that are going on in between pitches? Yeah, the ballpark is huge. Um, I, I love the details about ballparks and dimensions and just literally the layout, uh, what our view is from the press box. Uh, I also want to utilize the effects microphones uh, and, and, you know, if it's a radio broadcast, the sound, the overall sound of the broadcast is paramount. So you should hear the peanut vendors and the beer vendors and you should hear the umpire yell strike one or ball two you, you've got to hear the, the crack of the bat uh the, those things it's it's a symphony and when you talk about a swing and a drive to left you know you you have to in my opinion as a radio listener you have to hear the ball hit the bat and you know in some broadcasts uh, you don't hear a lot of the crowd I think when the, the crowd is smaller, it's more important to actually get that atmosphere. When the crowd is big, you know, it's it's kind of you're going to hear it no matter what. But, yeah, I think hearing the atmosphere is as important as describing it, because there are times when you lay out and it, it puts you in the ballpark because the announcer's not talking. You just feel like you're a fan because you can hear the cacophony of you know, the, the, the swell of the, the crowd before the big pitch of the game. I think that's enormous. What can you tell us about your uh, daily preparation getting ready? Say it's a Friday game, the start of a series between the White Sox and the Royals. Uh, what is the work you do leading up to it? And I imagine, not to put words in your mouth, but I imagine your daily prep that you've done with the Cubs, now going from TV to radio with the White Sox, won't be much different at this point. No, I don't think it'll be uh, a whole lot different. Uh, my... You know, my daily prep uh, for a game would be, you know, get up, grab a cup of coffee, get on the Internet, check out the uh, check out the daily clips, you know, the White Sox clips in this case. Uh, definitely go to the Royals website and, and their beat writers and, and, you know, make sure I, I know what they're up to. Uh, I do a lot of starting pitcher work uh, for each team. Uh, and then I'm always looking at the headlines from around the game. Uh, I try to find the capsules from the, the, the night before. If there are any interesting notes uh, from games around the league, just because I don't get a chance to watch or listen to a lot of the other games, I want to keep up with the rest of the, the league. Uh, if I find a story about a player or a team uh, not even related to what I'm doing, I'll clip that and put it in my notes for that team or that player for down the road. Uh, typically, I work about a week ahead of time. So if it's uh, Royals, White Sox, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then the Indians come in Monday and the Tigers come in Thursday, uh, I will also look ahead at the Tigers and Indians, you know, for about a uh, I try to do about five to seven days ahead in advance. So when that series starts, 
uh, I have a little, uh, you know, pad there where I'm not, you know, cramming for the final exam, so to speak. Uh, and then, you know, that takes about an hour and a half, two hours of my morning typically. And then, you know, I'll get to the ballpark between uh, three and three thirty. Uh, if I have to do uh, an interview, I'll hopefully do that. You know, around that time, I'll spend time in the home clubhouse for maybe a half hour, 15 minutes, depends on what's going on that day. Make sure I check in with the media relations department. And then uh, typically by 4.30, uh, I'm in the booth uh, kind of getting my, my lineup and game notes ready. Uh, and then away we go once uh, game time hits. So that's that's pretty much my routine on a daily basis. And how do you get everything organized? And then how do you score the game? Because I know that's evolved for you over the years. Yeah, I actually score on my uh, computer. Um, I, uh, I have a numbers uh, program, which is the Mac version of uh, Excel. And uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, you know, I, I've gotten it to a point where it's, it's very easy to, you know, just type in the, 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 the names. I don't put a lot of information uh, on that scorecard, I have that information in another file uh, that I have also, also up on my computer. I try to leave my my scorecard pretty uncluttered. Um, and then that's all in one big, huge page. So like the whole season is at my fingertips, which is nice. Uh, and, you know, I, I used to have a book, um, but I think with a computer and a book, you know, there's just too many. I mean, everything I do right, right now is on this. 13 inch macbook pro so you know I, i'm i'm i don't have a big bag anymore i used to have a bag of you know, media guys and all this stuff and everything's kind of in that computer and if it's not you know it's it's probably something i don't particularly need to use you know i've i've streamlined a lot of my uh, preparation and information over the course of uh, the last 20 years and you know i think you should over prepare and and probably research way more than you need early in your career and i think you learn over the course of time just okay you know i'm probably doing 20 percent more than i need to and i don't need to dive so deeply into this but i need to give a little more time to this um, and then the other part is if it's a three-game series against the royals uh the, the big mistake a young broadcaster can make is you give every biographical bit of information on the other team as every batter comes to the plate. And then not only do you not have much information for the last three or four plate appearances that day, but you, you have two more games. <laughs> and so, you know, I try to make a note of kind of doing a deep dive on one or two guys per day. Uh, I have all the information I need on all the other players, but you know, you have one note, on a guy that, you know, the, maybe the utility guy gets a rare start playing right field, you know, you can't overdo it, especially when it's a, t a player on the other team, you know, your viewers or listeners really want to know mostly about what's going on with your team. And when it comes to the other club, I think you, you just have to be on alert for the really interesting things. Those, those things that you just find fascinating, those always play. Those, those always work no matter who it is. Um, but the mundane stuff is mundane. And, and when it becomes filler, you have to, I think, recognize that and realize that you're just doing it just to fill the space. And there may be a better use of your time during a game. How do you structure, say, the, the human interest stories? And it's easier to tell stories, I guess, on TV because people can say the picture and you don't have to stop and pause for the pitch. And now, for you, I'm sure there's going to be a bit of adjustment of storytelling on radio when you have to, again, pause for the one-two. And how over the years, how has, you know, the evolution for you and, and getting better at storytelling been? Because for me, it's one of the hardest things to do as a broadcaster. I think, number one, you have to find a way to have that story condensed, um, whether you've written it down um, in, in bullet points or, or whatever, uh, the process of researching and, and writing it down for me is huge, and it allows me to ad lib and tell the story later in a more natural form. Uh, so that's number one. And I think number two, the best way to tell a story is that something happens in the game that reminds you or is a perfect in. Uh, again, going back to Ernie Harwell, I uh, was listening to a Tigers-Brewers game, 
and he said something to the effect of Ben Ogilvy grabs a bat from the rack and is now in the on deck circle. And it was, uh, you know, Don money at the plate and Ernie then gave a very concise history of the bat rack. It was amazing. He just very fluidly said, you know, ma major league teams used to just lay the bats out in front of the dugouts but around 1935, Stan Hack of the Cubs tripped over one of those bats. And Bobby Doerr, the clubhouse manager for the Cubs, not to be confused with the uh, Red Sox second baseman, uh, devised a box, uh, built a box in which the bats were set in the dugout. And that was the genesis of the bat rack. And they had a long conversation about it. And it was just a beautiful little nugget of history that Ernie had in kind of the back of his mind that he waited to use at a moment where it fit. And, and those are the, those are the, look, you know, calling a home, a walk off home run, you know, that there's, that there's nothing better than that. But for me, especially the more I do this, it's those types of moments where you can fit in this great story and have a, a fan or a listener say, I never knew that. I had no idea. I just assumed that everybody put their bats in the rack. I'm like, no, they actually laid them out on the dirt in front of the dugout, which sounds dangerous and crazy. But, you know, the evolution of the game is, is really fascinating. And it was a story from, you know, 80 years ago. Uh, I think there would be some TV or radio executives who may go, you know, don't talk about the 30s. Nobody cares. I'm telling you, there's no baseball fan who wouldn't want to hear that story, right? That's an interesting story. It just is. And if it, if it interests me, Kyle, I guess to go back to your original question, if it interests me, I can make it interesting to the fan or the listener. Uh, the thing I fight against is trying to cater my work and, and my style and my philosophy to what I think other people want. Uh, that that's a, that's a fool's errand because you end up chasing and you end up maybe doing things that you don't, buy into or believe in uh, but you're guessing that other people want i think the best way to do it is if you can be passionate about something and find it really interesting you're going to make it that much more fascinating for the people listening to the story and i want to ask you too while we have you about tv on camera opens for me that's that's one of the things that i've tried to work on throughout the years and, and being comfortable on camera when that red light first comes on for you, what's the key one to getting the comfort of those on-camera opens? What do you feel like? How much are you rehearsing or talking about what you're going to talk about on a daily basis? How have those gone for you throughout the years? It's all about experience. Uh, I, I think doing a TV open, um, and I was never told how to do it or what to do ever. Uh, I just was thrown in the deep end, and I was really bad at it when I started, and I got better at it. Uh, I think I you know, I jotted down notes, I scripted things. And then I got to a point where, you know, I don't want to script it. I don't want to say the same things every time. Um, I, I think it, it's the bullet point thing where in your head, um, you know, let's say the Cubs White Sox, we, we finished the season at guaranteed rate field. Both teams were in the playoffs. I think the Cubs had won the first two games and so just the thought in my head is final day of this unique season, both Chicago club clubs hope to play deep into October. Today, the Cubs go for the sweep. Like, that's it, right? And so when you get on camera, the idea is just to empty your mind and just that's all that you have to think about are those three bullet points. And you, know, you kind of rehearse it in your head, so to speak, but not really. And then you Light comes on. Hey, Jim Deshays, Len Casper, here we go. Final game of the season. And then we have two topics. And so I might just jot down a quick note on a piece of paper in front of me where if I forget what the next topic is, I've done that. Mm -hmm. uh, I could probably find an open where I'm talking and I'm thinking I have no idea what the next topic is. And I've messed it up. I know at, I know at one point I probably would kind of re-ask the same question again and I could tell JD knew that I was like, I have no idea what we're supposed to talk about. And then he segued into it. And then after it, we laughed and he goes, yeah, no, I could tell you didn't, you know, it happens. But I think the, over the course of time, you are better able to recover. And that's the other big thing about experience is that 
you know, Jim Nance doesn't make many mistakes, but whatever mistakes he makes, you probably just don't notice them. It's it's the fact that he can get out of that mistake or recover from it way faster than everybody else. Uh, nobody's perfect. Nobody has a, you know, 100 out of 100 on a broadcast. But, man, that's experience when you've done this 100, 1,000, 3,000, 4,000 times. Uh, you've had everything thrown at you known to man, and you're just able to kind of swim your way through it. Um, it should be weird. It should feel awkward. It should be difficult. If this job were easy, if on-camera opens were easy, everybody could do it. The idea is that only a very few are really, really good at it, and that's the point. And what can you tell us as well about uh, just using your voice as an instrument and the conversational style that you've had with us uh, during this show today is extremely similar and really matches whatever you've done with the Cubs and what you'll do with the White Sox on radio. But do you ever think about your voice maybe in a big moment when it's a walk-off home run or a no-hitter or anything like that, or you just try to focus on being conversational the entire time? Yeah, I think there's, a like I said, pacing and energy are, are important um, your voice becomes huge in terms of the command, and that's kind of the big thing. So you're trying to be natural while also being in command of the broadcast. And there's a way to do that. Uh, everybody has their own voice. But, you know, if I were on the game, I was kind of like, well, you know, talk, like that doesn't work. You, you have to project. You have to. It's the Cubs and the White Sox. It's not no, it's Cubs and the White Sox, you know. So it's 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 subtle, but you, you, you do have a broadcaster voice, so to speak, and you just have to be in command. And those are the voices that I like the most. Uh, and it's not just the timber and you know, Dan Schulman, you know, I would love to have his voice. He has just the greatest voice in sports. But there are a lot of uh, guys as well who – uh, whose voices aren't, I guess, objectively as soothing as Dan's, but the command they have is incredibly soothing. And for that reason, their voices are great. And and I think being yourself, being natural, while also saying, this is, I've got this. Uh, it's, it's the, when the earthquake happened in 89, you knew Al Michaels had it. He's on top of it. You want to exude, I got this, no matter what they're going to throw at us today, uh, I'm not going to panic. And, and that's the number one thing about utilizing your voice, I think, is just, we're good, it's relaxed, enjoy it, kind of a friendly tone, let's go. Final one from me, Len. When you think of maybe advice or maybe just a pep talk for the men and the women in the minors right now or just anybody who's trying to grind it out in this industry to get to one of the big jobs that, that you have, uh, what's just the overarching advice for those people? Practice makes perfect. Uh, however good you think you are today, you're going to be better next week and in six months and in a year. Uh, relationships matter. I think the relationships you make organically matter the most. And I, the number one note when applying for a job, this is just my opinion, you don't have to heed my advice. The best recommendation will come from somebody who you worked for or with. And it does not matter if that person is known by anybody on the planet. So the example would be if a young broadcaster sent me a couple tapes over the course of three or four years, and I only knew this person uh, based on a couple of phone conversations. I would not be the best reference for somebody, even somebody I know, because I cannot tell you what the person is like. I can tell you how they sound, but the person who uh, you worked for or with knows everything about you and to me there's a depth of knowledge that uh, a director uh, a manager a gm a program director uh, a former partner that they have that that somebody like me might not have i understand the tendency to be able to tell people that a bob costas or an Ernie Harwell, uh, when Ernie was around, could be 
uh, a reference and, and give you a recommendation. But I'm here to tell you guys that I don't think those phone calls really mean nearly as much. And it's to me more impressive and much more uh, instructive for somebody hiring somebody to say, oh, Kyle worked for you for three years. Okay. Tell me about this. Tell me about this. Tell me about this. As opposed to kind of a generic, yeah, I was on a podcast with him once and he seemed like a nice guy. (laughs) You're going to get a million people to say that. Uh, It's going to be the person who knows you really well, who I think will give you a much better uh, recommendation. And to finish things up, again, uh, you're the new radio voice for the Chicago White Sox, but you're going to get to collaborate as well with your friends on the television side, Jason Benetti, Steve Stone, in addition to Darren Jackson. Just how excited are you for everything to get going? And I'm sure as well you're very excited for post-pandemic baseball that hopefully is coming up very, very soon. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm totally excited about White Sox-Cubs, like spring training and the summer. And uh, John Shambi, my great friend, is mm-hmm. uh, going to be – uh, with with Jim Deshays uh, in my old gig, uh, Benetti is just a comet. This this he's a once in a lifetime. He's such a smart, wise, funny, kind, brilliant guy. Uh, we'll we'll do some social media stuff, maybe a, a podcast of some kind. I don't know if we'll create some wild Twitter handle or do some Twitch stuff, but uh, we'll have a blast. Uh, I'm going to get to do a few games with Stony, which will be a, a great thrill for me. Uh, since I've never done any uh, games with him. And uh, the big one is Darren Jackson. I I think he's a terrific broadcaster, great guy. Uh, And I look forward to getting to know him even better and and knowing what makes him laugh when he's in the middle of some, you know, pithy uh, analytical note. I'm just going to, like, jump in and make him laugh. And I want to derail him so he can't finish his (laughs) sentence. I mean, that's the goal. That's the fun of doing this job. So I'm just... I'm chopping at the bit to get going, guys. Well, Lynn, we can't wait. Again, uh, I grew up a big Cubs fan in Tennessee, so my only connection to the Cubs outside of our family uh, making the drive to Chicago each and every summer was the Cubs on WGN. And uh, when I got to see you uh, after Chip Carey, who had been one of my heroes, and then you stepped in that chair, did such a wonderful job for all those years. And uh, my family loved watching you with the Cubs. Now they'd be listening to the White Sox. But just thank you for your great work to inspire me to help get into this business. But uh, just thank you so much for the time you've given us over the past hour, especially hand-holding the iPhone uh, ice down you know definitely but thank you again for all of your uh, great insights today we've enjoyed it uh, my pleasure guys really uh, enjoyed the hour let's do it again sometime thanks Lynn that sounds good that's Lynn Casper the new radio voice of the Chicago White Sox thank you for watching this edition of Broadcaster Hour <laughs>